Okay, so does anyone know where the word claudication came from? Any history buffs? I was a history major in college. You guys remember the Roman Emperor Claudius? Yeah. So he actually walked with a limp after he was walking, and he had to stop in order to start walking again. So the Latin word for to limp is claudicate. So that's the word claudication. It actually was coined for vascular claudication by Jean-Martin Charcot. You, everyone knows Charcot, the, the word, the name, the eponymous diseases, many of which use his name. So claudication is to limp. And we're going to focus on neurogenic claudication, right? We're talking about interventional spine, not vascular, of course. So obviously rule out your patients for vascular claudication. But neurogenic claudication, this is something you're going to see more and more and more. Why? Because patients are getting older and older and older. Right? Uh, when Claudius was around, we were living till we were about 35, 40 on average, maybe at best, in the Holy Roman Empire. Right now, what's our average age? 79 right now. Took a little dip after COVID. Um, but we're going to see more and more of this. So, this is a super important diagnosis. And then, of course, link it to the radiological finding of lumbar spinal stenosis, which Doug is going to go and discuss in great detail after I am done. So this is a shared space. No matter if you do everything we're teaching you today regarding decompression of lumbar spinal stenosis or you never do any of this, you have to know how to diagnose this problem because it is ubiquitous. So this is the clinical presentation. You probably have seen this poster, this postcard, this slide. It's probably the one that most resonates with patients, primary care providers, et cetera. And that is a patient who has pain with walking and standing and sees improvement with flexion. And here are some of the devices they may use. They may love to go to Costco and use a shopping cart because they can just cruise around just fine leaning over that shopping cart. They park next to the cart corrals. They want to sit. They're in a wheelchair. They go to parks where they know where each park bench is so that they can walk around the park because they have to sit for a few minutes before they can get up and walk again. Or they come, in they come to you with a walker. And so why do patients do that? I'm going to show you sort of the biomechanics of what's happening at the functional spinal unit. But these are the patients you need to identify. And quite frankly, even though I thought this is a really simple diagnosis for everyone to find, we see that many, many pain physicians that we teach, Dr. Mehta and I, they miss this. They're right under their nose. Um, so it's really important you identify these patients. And so that, that presentation can look like this. It can be pain. It can be cramping. It can be weakness, tingling. And as I mentioned, it's worsened with walking or standing. It doesn't have to be bilateral. It can be one side. And then there's that improvement with flexion, which is the most important thing. That's really the differentiating point compared to vascular claudication or other issues. So this is a non-dermatomal pain, right? Pretty non-specific, going to the buttocks, the leg, the thigh, et cetera. Um, and it relieves when the patient sits down or when they flex forward. So why is it that patients get relief with leaning forward? So it all comes back to the functional spinal unit, right? So it's really important to really understand this, because this is everything for what we do. I think of the functional spinal unit as a three-legged stool. The front leg is that vertebrodisco complex, the anterior column. It's the big leg. It's the leg that everyone focuses on, right? Patient comes in with back pain, oh, it's got to be a disc. It's got to be a disc. Pretty rarely you get someone who comes in and says, oh, it's my facet. They might, but more rare. Everyone focuses on the disc. That's the biggest leg. The two small legs in the back are the articular pillars, the facet joints. So you have a three-legged stool, all right? You guys know what happens when you chop short one of the legs of a three-legged stool, right? There's imbalance. It puts more pressure on the one leg. The other two have to support. And so that's the natural degeneration of the functional spinal unit over time. This is a 14-year-old's functional spinal unit. Look what happens as we get older and older and older. So in this diagram on the left, you can see the normal FSU and then what happens presumably to someone in their 20s or 30s or lifting weights or moving furniture. Then in their 40s, 50s, like my age, bulging discs, got sciatica, herniated discs, whatever. Then by the time we get to the 50s, 60s, thinning disc, and then, of course, 70s, 80s, disc degeneration, osteophyte formation, stenosis, right? This is the natural progression of the human being 
Uh, and as I said, we're only gonna see more and more of that as patients continue to age. So this is exactly what's happening, obviously not always in this perfect sequence, but this is why patients develop that spinal canal stenosis. Now, we, when we talk about spinal canal stenosis, we, we say canal as if it's one cylinder, okay? It's not. Uh, as you can see in this diagram, we have to look at basically three different zones. You can see the foramina, the neural foramen. That's one diameter to look at. The next is the lateral recess, which is underneath the facet joints, and then the next is the central canal. So those three zones are what you have to look at for each functional spinal unit. We talk about lumbar spinal stenosis as one thing, meaning narrowing of the spinal canal or the neural foramina, but it's due to a lot of different things. And it's really important to understand which of these things are contributing to the stenosis because depending on which procedures we're gonna show you today, they may affect certain things but not other things, right? So we all, you know, disc herniations are basically inevitable. I mean, it's like 100% of patients by the time they're 80 are gonna have disc herniations, right? The Brinjiki article from 2016. Facet hypertrophy, that naturally happens, as I already mentioned. One leg gets shortened by the disc height loss. The facets start taking on more pressure. They enlarge. Osteophytes form. Dr. Gandhi showed us the mild procedure, the ligamentum flavum hypertrophies. We see that over time. So for that particular procedure, if you see more than two millimeters, you're thinking about it. So that's something you can easily see on your T1 MRI, axial view. Osteophytes, they're inevitable. The question is which ones are, are creating symptoms? Epidural lipomatosis, there's no great therapy for that right now. That's probably one of those issues where we could really use some investment because when I see a patient with epidural lipomatosis causing stenosis, everyone sort of goes, eh, I don't know what's gonna make this much better. Um, our surgeons are jumping on that for surgical indication and certainly a lot of the things I do are not great for it. And injections may provide temporary relief and they're easy to do because obviously there's huge epidural space, but nonetheless, long-term outcomes are great. And then, of course, spondylolisthesis, the slippage of one vertebrae over the other. It's really important in your mind to differentiate between two types of spondylolisthesis. Stable, the ones where the patient leans forward, backwards, but the, the millimeters of translation is very minimal versus unstable or dynamic, where it's more than three millimeters in the lumbar spine. To me, anyone with an unstable, dynamic spondylolisthesis, that's automatic surgeon referral, no question. That You guys have to identify that. If you learn, if you never do any of this interventional stuff, maybe you just do epidural steroid injections, you have to understand when to refer to a surgeon. That is a no-brainer. Dynamic instability. The surgeon may not operate. They may not choose to fuse for all sorts of reasons, but that to me is an automatic referral. So certainly look for that flexion extension x-rays. Here are the three zones. They have different symptomatology based on where the stenosis is, central versus lateral recess versus foraminal. In general, you get that non-dermatomal pain with central canal stenosis, and then as you move more lateral, you see more dermatomal-like pain. But again, the key thing with these three zones is relief with flexion. That is to differentiate the patient who has radicular symptoms that has no relief with flexion, right? So that differentiates it from radiculitis or sciatica, as we colloquially call it. And then this is it. Uh, this picture says it all. So why do patients come to you crouched forward? Why do the 80-year-olds look like this? They can't help it. They naturally need to flex forward in order to create more space in all of those three zones, the central lateral recess and neural foramina. Um, and when they're walking or standing, that's when you see the, the, the compression and the micro ischemic events of the nerves occur, and that's what leads to symptoms. So really simple to point that out to patients, right? Even when, when I talk to some of my 75-year-old patients, I'll ask them, do you notice that you hunch forward? No, 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 I would never do that. Why? Pride. They don't wanna be an old person. They wanna be young. They wanna say, I can hike 10 miles, no problem. But then their spouse is in the corner going, <laughs> yeah, they do. I see them all the time bending forward. They can't help that. So you really need to get into detailed questions about you know, what makes their pain better or worse and what they're looking like in their everyday lives. When I was in fellowship, when I was in your shoes, this is all we had basically from an interventional standpoint for lumbar spinal stenosis. You had epidural steroid injections, and then you had surgery. That was it. That was it. And either the patients would go through an algorithm of try an epidural steroid injections, you know, once, twice, three times, 10 times, whatever it was, and then get to a surgeon, 
or the patient would say, I never want to have surgery, and they would just stick in the epidural surgery, or vice versa. Like, I want this fixed. Let's go to the surgeon, okay? Now we've got all this in the last 10 years. So Dr. Gandhi just showed you percutaneous minimally invasive lumbar decompression. I don't just call it minimally invasive lumbar decompression because of the surgeons are like, no, we do minimally invasive lumbar decompression. Minimally invasive is a term that's really being used in a lot of different arenas, so we just need to be mindful about what we're talking about there. Non-fixating indirect lumbar decompression, I'm gonna show you that in the lab in hopefully 20 minutes. And then Doug's gonna show you fixating indirect lumbar decompression, the interspinous fixation devices. Laminectomy is no longer just laminectomy. I'm not a surgeon, but there has been advancement, innovation in how we do laminectomy over the years. ULBD, uh, unilateral laminectomy with bilateral decompression is one technique that a surgeon I work with uses because they're starting to realize that you don't need to decompress a lot to create a big change symptomatically. Um, one of the surgeons who retired in our group, whenever I saw his decompressions, you would see the MRIs, the x-rays, be you could drive a semi-truck through the spinal canal. I mean, it was the biggest decompression. And he would be like, yeah, I decompressed that spine. <laughs> Probably unnecessary, right? We just need to do a few millimeters to make a big difference. And I think that's what these intermediate procedures have really taught a lot of the community is like, really? That little bit of decompression makes that big of a difference? And I think that hopefully is, is flowing into the surgeon's realm and whether there's endoscopic or whatever new innovations are coming their way. Um, and then fusion, of course, is for that unstable spine. I put that on there because if you have an unstable spine with stenosis, then that, that would be the way to go. So that is, your, that is your current, right? And there's probably gonna be more and more stuff Doug's probably cooking up that's gonna fit in this algorithm. Patients want more minimally invasive. They want safer. They don't want big recoveries. But at the same time, we've gotta know when to refer. You can't be closed to surgery. You can't say, oh, I'd never send you to a surgeon. I send to a surgeon probably once a week because that patient deserves it, even though I do a ton of this other stuff. So just really understand that algorithm, whether you do it yourselves or not, you've gotta know how to direct patients, because it gets more and more complicated as we learn new and new things. All right, Doug, I'll try to go fast. To you for the radiological, and I'll go in the lab. Okay, I was not a history major, but I'll give you a little bit of uh, Roman uh, theme here. So the concept of a mile was first developed by the distance a Roman legion could walk at a thousand paces. How about that? So for 2,000 years, people tried to run it less than four minutes and took 2,000 years. Does anybody know the name of the person who first broke the four minute barrier in the mile? Roger Bannister is done on May 6th, 1954, on a muddy track in Oxford. Does anybody know how long it took for the next person to break four minute barrier? 46 days. Does anybody know his name? No, of course not. It was John Landy, but nobody knows his name. <laughs> 